I was a seed buried deep. As days went by, the sun warmed the earth and water seeped into the soil. I burst forth into the sunshine. I put forth a few leaves. Out came my first flower. I kept a close watch on things around, seeing, observing. Curious to know what lies around and in the great beyond, I sent my roots deeper and my shoots higher, seeking the new, the different, the odd, the oft excluded. I grew on my own terms and the world cheered. Over a few summers, my trunk grew and supported more branches. Each branch grew and became self-sufficient. Many a creeper climbed alongside me, embracing me, growing with me. I became home to many creatures, creatures of various hues. Some came to learn, leaping from one branch to another. Some climbed on my branches and made friends with many a busy squirrel, communed with dragonflies, hung out with bees and wasps. There was a constant buzz in the air as everyone here had a mind of their own. Some came seeking new ideas, exchanging new realities, constantly evolving. As my canopy expanded, my roots entered the wood wide web and I could nourish many smaller worlds, bridge many a gap. They still come from far and wide to sit under my shade, discuss worldly matters and seek solutions. I have seen many summers, a few droughts. Friends have lent a shoulder when times were hard. I have learned to be resilient and seek deeper connections with the world around me. Some call me a large living microcosm. To others, I am a tree.
ಮೈಕ್ಸ್ ಎಲ್ಲ ಅನ್ಮ್ಯೂಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಳ್ಳಿ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಮೈಕ್ಸ್
Hi, good afternoon and welcome to everybody. So nice to see many familiar faces and to see an exciting gathering here. So you're in for a good um, hour of uh, fun talks and some enlightenment. So before we uh, begin, there's also a few exciting things happening. There's an exciting contest for all of you here. So Atri is giving you a chance to win two nights free stay if you tweet about this afternoon. It's pretty easy to do. All you have to do is take out your cell phone and uh, hashtag Atri TNK and you get two nights free stay at uh, BR Hills or MM Hills at the field station. The more you tweet, maybe the more nights you get. Or maybe not. But uh, let's uh, quickly get through some housekeeping. Once you finish tweeting, please put your phones on silent mode so that you don't disturb the speakers coming up. And also, um, very quickly, uh, there's plenty of space for people coming in. I hope you've enjoyed your tea and coffee. We've got to get started and we've got to stay on time. So a quick note for our speakers this afternoon. You have eight minutes and then there's about two minutes of Q&A. For the audience, please don't feel terrified. No one's going to bite you if you ask any questions. So please feel free. To get things started this evening, I thought I'd uh, get some help from one of my mentors because this afternoon is all about diversity. And like I said, before we, before we actually get started this afternoon, there's a couple of things. Some people couldn't make it. Uh, Dr. Bawa couldn't make it from the US and uh, we're gonna miss his presence here, but he's probably watching us from far away. And also, we just had the sad news that Anita won't be joining us this afternoon because her father passed away yesterday. So if we can all please take a moment to observe a moment of silence. Thank you all. So to start off this afternoon, I just thought I'd look back and see how we begin a talk like this. It's obvious that there's a lot of variety in the talks that are happening. And I reached out to my mentor, Sir David Attenborough, for a few words to get started on the theme for this evening. And it's all about an infinite variety. So my father brought this book from 40 years ago. It's Life on Earth by Sir David Attenborough. And the very first chapter, an infinite variety kind of jumped out at me and said, this is where we need to begin. So in, in his words, I'd like to start. It's not difficult to discover an unknown animal. Spend a day in the tropical forests of South America or the Western Ghats, turning over logs, looking beneath bark, sifting through the moist litter of leaves, followed by an evening shining a mercury vapor lamp on a white screen. And one way or another, you will collect hundreds of different kinds of small creatures, moths, caterpillars, spiders, long-nosed bugs, luminous beetles, butterflies, butterflies disguised as wasps, wasps shaped like ants, sticks that walk, and leaves that talk. Leaves that talk is my part. The variety will be so enormous, and one of these creatures will almost entirely be undescribed by science. The difficulty will be finding specialists who know enough about the groups concerned to be able to single out the new one. And that was what the beginning of all of this was about. 
the beginning of Atri. And Atri celebrates its 25th birthday this year. And a big round of applause to all the founders, Kamal Bawa, Ganeshaya, Uma Shankar. And this fundamental consortium of minds came together with a common goal to put together their passion and to bring about an, a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary organization that can bring together these specialists that can help put names on all of these different species. And by calling things by their right name is really the beginning of wisdom. And along the way, Atri had many friends, many friends who had to come together uh, to create what is now a stellar organization. And one of the original trustees of Atri was Dr. Tien Kushu. And in order to introduce Tien Kushu, is a very close family friend. No longer are we colleagues, it's become part of the Atri family. And one person who I met uh, several years ago, probably at an Atri event, was Dr. Raj Kushu. He's part of the Kushu Endowment Committee and an advisory council member at Atri. He's the senior vice president of the Strategic Alliances for Siemens Digital Industry Software, a business unit of um, the Siemens Digital Industries and recently honored as Siemens 2022 Top Innovator. Along with Dr. Kamal Bawa, he instituted the TN Kushu Memorial Award to honor the legacy of his father. Please join me in welcoming Raj Kushu to the stage. So let me tell you about my experience with this gentleman. You see this photograph, see the eyes of this. See him, this is in the book called Sahadris. When I saw this picture, I was absolutely fascinated for a photographer to capture the essence of what this renunciate is all about. Just look at him. His glare, whether it's setting sun, it looks like setting sun. And uh, he's right up on. Uh, so I was so fascinated. And then uh, I met Angesh at that time. And I asked him for his picture. Right? And the reason I asked him for this picture, would you move to the next one? Move it forward, please. So in many years, I spent a couple hundred thousand miles on aircraft traveling the world for my job. And my passion was to convert this into digital digital uh, images. So I have something for you today. Okay. So my home is full of all this. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So So uh, I'm, I'm pitching in for Dr. Bawa because he couldn't be here. Uh, just talking briefly about the award uh, and the genesis of all this. But uh, the fact of the matter is that, <coughs> excuse me, that we started this as a, uh, as a, a small endowment. Uh, Dr. Bawa was instrumental, so was Dr. Bidzat. And then we collected some very good uh, uh, supporters, the Koshu family, Dr. Bala is right here, the Sagal Foundation, Ford Foundation. Uh, and then uh, uh, we created a small corpus. Uh, and the whole idea was, the way I was explained is that this whole idea of 
sustainable development, biodiversity has three legs to the stool. Research, policy, and action. They all have to intermingle with each other and they are collectively together. Now, it so happens that policy usually is has some latency behind research. Yeah, yeah okay, sorry about that. Uh, generally, policy has a latency, uh, um, but the idea here is that all three are integral part of moving this planet forward. So then what we created is a charter for the organization and how we will recognize people who have contributed to the Indian uh, environment, one, sometimes two. Um, and then we gave a little award recognition, the keynotes, you saw the keynotes. I mean, we have been able to attract world-class keynotes and that's because of the reach of ATRE and the reach of Dr. Bhava and all the colleagues. So here we are. Uh, we never expected to be here in 2022, so many years later, and successfully executing you know, year over year over year. And I would really like from my heart to thank Atri, Dr. Bala in particular, and all the directors, uh, Dr. Bala, who uh, my father very much, uh, uh, because he, he saw in Dr. Bala a, a science and economics and finance together, the multidisciplinary my multidisciplinary approach, which is essential today. So uh, this idea of what Hitri calls multidiscipline, I call it multi-domain, these three legs of the stool, policy, action, and research have to go all together. So again, thanks for inviting me, uh, Sandesh. Uh, we can go ahead with the program. Appreciate your time. There you are. We won't let you off the stage so easily. So, um... I have a small uh, return gift for Raj. This is a book that uh, he himself was a mastermind of, the person behind it. It's called Champions of Change. It's essays on Tian Koshu Memorial Awardees over the years. When did it first begin? The book? Well, no, the, the, award, the awards, 2004, so it's been, Nearly, yeah, yeah, 20 years, 18 years. Yes, yes. So this book celebrates the outstanding work in the field of science and environment conservation and presents the untold stories of perseverance and resilience to those in the field. The book was conceptualized by Raj. I'm sure he has seen it, but I have been asked to please present him this book. Yes. I look forward to reading it. Thank you. Yes. Break. I think it's a commercial break. Yeah, there might be some more of these. Also, by the way, uh, for um, Karthik, we're just showing you what you need to do when you come up here to receive the award. Right? You come here, you stand, you pose. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I please ask you to stay on stage because we need to get you back up here. Uh, and. As we thank you for the introduction and the background of the T.N. Kushu Awards. Now, before we actually begin the award ceremony, I'd like to ask Made Gauru uh, to please come on stage. He's a Soliga, an indigenous uh, tribal community from Karnataka. Now, this image of a wasp, you'll be wondering why we have it up here, but this is something in homage to the community that Made Gauru is from, the Soligas. This has been named by uh, Ranjit and uh, Priyadarshan here at Atri, a whole new genera of wasp to, um, to commemorate the Soliga tribe. And, uh, and this is their second species that they've described. The first one was in honor of Atri, and this one is in honor of the Soliga tribe. The Soligas are an indigenous tribal community from Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Historically, they've been engaged in shifting cultivation and collection of NTFPs, non-timber forest products, including honey. Dr. Made Gauda, a Soliga, holds a PhD in social work. He's contributed in mobilizing the honey harvesters to form a society and introduce sustainable ways to efficiently collect and process honey. 
Thank you. So he has a small uh, surprise for us. He has a poem and he's going to talk about how we're intertwining culture and nature. Would you like to say a few words before you start? Okay. So we the Adivasi community of Sotega are living in the BRA and uh, we worship nature. We worship, we have worship God, God has all the stone and also we worship wild animals, tiger, leopard, goat, somber. So these are all sacred animals for us. And also we have harvesting festival called Roti Abba. So during the Roti Abba, we sing our song of Guru Kana. The Guru Guru Kana is the sound from the evergreen forest. Kana is evergreen forest in our soul legal language. And also today I'm singing the song on the uh, Manna Tege Tege Manna Kimawa with the bird. And the bird, wherever the nest, nesting in the different tree species, and also in the different uh, stone, soil, huts, and different bamboos. So that song I will sing now today. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Aro luka della manna ki godo. Aro luka della manna ki godo. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Mati kadella manna ki godo. Mati kadella manna ki godo. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Onne kadella manna ki godo. Onne kadella manna ki godo. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Oddu hodella manna ki godo. Oddu hodella manna ki godo. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Mati kadella manna ki godo. Mati kadella manna ki godo. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Kallu kallella manna ki godo. Kallu kallella manna ki godo. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. Mara marella manna ki godo. Mara marella manna ki godo. Manna tege tege manna ki mawa. So um, now, now we're part of the evening. Okay. So now we're getting to the part of the evening that uh, we're all waiting for. So before we uh, before we begin, I'd like to call on our board of trustee, Professor Padmanabhan Bal Balram. He's the co-chair of ATRI, a biochemist by training. Professor Balram is the former director of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He's the recipient of the Padma Bhushan and the R. Bruce Merrifield Award 2021. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, sir. So we're gonna start with uh, calling on uh, our TN Kushu Award winner. So before you come up on stage, Karthik. Huh? So Dr. Karthik Balasubramaniam is a lower plant systematist from India based at the Agarkar Institute in Pune. He's conducted pioneering work on the taxonomy and systematics of freshwater diatom flora in peninsular India and Northeast India, and continues to do so. He's described 106 new species or new combinations of diatoms from India and has erected two new genera. For his contribution towards diatom systematics, one, one, Atikya, is named after him. He's the only South Asian director of diatom base, a global level di database of diatoms in the world. I'd like to please welcome you onto the stage. Please. So we can have the award. So I'd like to ask uh, Professor Balram and Raj Kushu to please present the award to Karthik.
Thank you, Karthik. And we ha I have a little bit more about you. So if you can please stay there and um, uh, right there with a few more words. Apart from his classical taxonomic work, he also uses fossil diatoms to understand climate change and changes in habitat. His diatom expertise was used in archaeology to understand the age of civilization. He's one of the biggest proponents of science communication in regional languages and to reach out to the less privileged communities. He's published in over 70 research papers and contributed to science writing in Tamil, to magazines, newspapers, and to Wikipedia. Thank you very much. Yeah. A very good afternoon, good evening to all, and thanks to Atri uh, for selecting this, uh, selecting me for this prestigious award. So I'm going to uh, this evening is about thanks. So that's what I have decided to do. And I start this with uh, this quote by one of my collaborator, Professor Sigiki Mayama. He trains teachers. He's also a diatomist and he trains teachers. This quote says, like, if you can read, thank your teacher. If you can breathe, thank diatom. So uh, of course, everybody will agree with me about thanking teachers. But like, you will be wondering, like, why should I thank diatom? Because uh, diatom make almost 25 percentage of global oxygen. Roughly every fourth breath which we take, the oxygen comes exclusively from diatoms. And in terms of a primary productivity of diatoms, it's more than all the tropical forests put together. So it's a, such a significant group of organisms and lesser known. When I got the email uh, from Atri that, you know, you got selected for this award. So I, I went out and Googled about TN Kosho Award. So I saw this, um, uh, this logo and I was wondering what was this? For me, it was looking like a, again, diatoms because I try to see diatoms everywhere. So on the other side, you see this uh, diatom at a thousand X magnification. For me, all this was looking like uh, diatoms. So <clears throat> I take this opportunity to try, to uh, tell about more about diatoms. Diatoms are uh, microscopic algae, uh, but uh, they grow like uh, on stones and um, sediments. So uh, that's how diatom looks for a uh, naked eye if you don't have a microscope. When we want to look diatoms, we have to take the samples, we scrap the rock, scrap the uh, plants or scrap the animals, sometimes turtle back. And then uh, we look under the microscope, we see this beautiful intricately patterned uh, silica cell wall. That's the most uh, important feature for diatom because they are the only organism which makes silica cell wall. And we use these patterns for identification. So we are behind this uh, pattern, looking at this pattern at 100 times, 1,000 times, or like 50,000 times using an electron microscope. So they are the base of food chain. So all other uh, aquatic insects and fishes, everybody feed on uh, diatoms. And there are most diverse group of organisms. Until now, until today morning, we know 60, 65,000 uh, species of diatom but the total estimated number of diatoms are more than 2 million. So there are a lot of work for diatomists and there is a lot of, we need a lot of diatomists as well. So <clears throat> they are used as a bioindicator to uh, find the condition of environment past and present. And there are many valuable products coming from diatoms. One of the most celebrated one is like uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And then uh, to make it more connected to humans, like, you know, it's like diatomaceous earth, so diatomaceous, uh, no Alfred Nobel used diatomaceous earth to make di uh, dynamite and they made a lot of money and also received a lot of criticism for, you know, the dynamite killed a lot of people. So the family decided to put that money aside to create this Nobel Foundation. So indirectly diatom is driving global science in, by contributing to the uh, Nobel Prize. So I started in 2004 in this very campus. Uh, I'm here studying uh, 
water chemistry with a couple of oh, sorry couple of my friends uh, guru raja and sudhira they are here and uh, i i did my bachelor's on microbiology so the microbiology was inside me so when we were collecting water so accidentally we want to check what is there is the brown growth on the stones so that's how i i scratched that stone and then took it brought it here and then looked and that is the moment and since then i am hooked with diatoms so he started doing like uh, collecting diatoms all over the western ghats as a part of my phd then i need somebody to identify my diatom because there is no diatom is existing at that point of time then i started like you know who started diatom research in india it was in like any other group of organism we can divide diatom research into pre independence and post independence so apart from this uh, great contribution by the gentleman can erinberg and then there is lot after 1947 or 48 there is a huge contribution by this one man called hp gandhi hemendra kumar prativraj gandhi so i thought like you know he is the one who is going to help me identifying my diatoms okay i took all his paper so he every other day like you know okay i another one paper another one paper so it was like 40 plus papers he dis he dis i noticed this every paper have a different affiliation so how do i catch him like you know where do i go and where do i get my species identified so that's where i found this one very interesting paper by my work on indian freshwater diatoms and experience with indian referees and editor i recommend everybody to read this paper like you know if you it's it's there online if you don't find it like you can write to me i will send it every researcher should read this paper so it have a residential address so next day i am at junagadh and went and found him and uh, so before going more into detail so it's a very rare like in 1950 somebody started you know connecting uh, talking about biogeography and influence of geology in, in distribution so you can see like gandhi's papers are full of other information from it it can range from travel log to geology to biodiversity to you know you name it everything is there so he had mentioned about like western ghats region abounds in diatoms governed probably by some of the geological condition i'm just giving uh, a, a gist and this is the um, handmade drawing by hp gandhi using camera lucida diagrams so when i met him uh, he was not in a condition to the family said like he is not uh, he is not spoken for years but uh, his um, family was like you know if you want to try you can talk to him after a couple of days he um he started speaking he cried for maybe few minutes and then he started narrating his entire stories from how he got into diatoms to what was his journey everything he said and it's a long story like you know uh, but like to make it start like one thing like he was never funded even 1 rupee by any government or any any agency his wife uh, keep on telling that you know he comes from college on saturday evening and go inside this room and then come back on monday morning she just leave the food in the next to the door sometime and then she remove the old plate and put it new plate sometimes she said that that morning whatever i kept it will be there till evening he is just sitting keeping his legs spread on the microscope and doing all this camera lucida diagram and he was most celebrated globally whenever i go to international diatom meetings everybody asked like did you had a chance to meet da gandhi but like nobody recognized him in in our country nobody knows about him so when i went there what i want is i want name for all this thing but after some time what i got is he gave all his slides all his samples everything was given so you can see the samples and all from uh, collected in like powai lake in 1945 and borivili streams 1946 and so on so it's like hundreds of samples thousands of slides and um, this is the biggest collection as of now in southeast asia and um, we used this we started our work with uh, this as a foundation we just relooked whatever gandhi have described and you can with uh, his notes you can go back to the slide and you can sometime even it's you can see these red marks on the slide it's all made by gandhi like you know he he also notes like this is the tax or you need to look where it is so that's the it is the foundation for diatom research in india 
and after that like today we are doing whatever like you know in terms of taxonomy describing new species molecular phylogeny of diatom applying diatom to climate change uh, you know understand the last 10000 year climate change and so on and uh, we are using diatoms in forensic to uh, you know to to determine death by drowning cases and we make a lot of uh, bio future biofuels from diatoms and then nutraceuticals bio inspired designs and so on but all this thing comes from this uh, foundation which gandhi gave and i always believe in uh, people uh, connections and like time time people and um, space so this is the same hall maybe in in few uh, 2006 i presented my first paper uh, here in this same venue and today i'm get receiving this award and then my first book on diatoms of peninsular india was uh, funded by atri small grant 92000 Uh, it was uh, in 2013 and that's the first book and it's more than like 800 copies has been sold and uh, it's a on only book we have for uh, identifying diatoms and last week i stumbled upon this picture where like a uh, uh, dr t n kosho visiting agarkar research institute in 1985 uh, for inauguration of uh, science exhibition at our institute so i find like some kind of connection between these three pictures and i want to read out this note from gandhi uh, all the efforts that this author made in the field of diatomology was aimed at to provide best of work on the subject to the indian workers of today and tomorrow in terms of description and illustrations of diatom despite of immense limitation at colleges and i am receiving this award on behalf of gandhi he did not uh, uh, we didn't uh, i we didn't identify him and i am uh, receiving this for him and for the whatever the diatom work which he have done and i take this moment to thank my mentors from my school teachers to my today's my uh, seniors in my institute and elsewhere and my friends i am whatever i am because of my friends and my family particularly alka and my students who are uh, all who are the workforce who are who are everything whatever i shown here thank you everybody yeah yeah please stay on stage for questions so i think there are two mics around so um, if anyone has questions please well one thing i can say for sure is that um, i'll appreciate every breath i take and think of diatoms more yeah <clears throat> yes please or you can say it loud enough and, and... the question is how diatoms and forensics are connected so there is a test called diatom test in forensic which is more than 150 years old and used even today so when we when a victim get into the water so they they drink lot of water so they take lot of diatoms so we try to the forensic department want to match the diatoms in the lungs and the other body parts and then outside diatom so many cases what happen like you know if the person is killed and and the, you know the body is thrown so you don't take that you don't drink lot of water so you don't there is no diatom so it's a negative test and then positive test and many cases what happen if the person is killed in a swimming pool or somewhere else and then body is thrown on a river or estuary so all these places have different set of diatom so we can uh, conclude uh, you know where where was this person got killed and then with other evidence we can match it thank you what about in different drainage basins of rivers do you have different assemblages of diatom yeah based on the diatom we can also get an idea like you know is it like you know peninsular indian sample or northeast indian sample or like himalayan samples so we can uh, diatom have diatom change across space and time so in the early hydrocarbon explorations people get samples that time we did not have lot of this sophisticated techniques to ascertain the, 
till what age we reached. So that was done by uh, diatoms. So we have separate eosin diatom, miosin diatom, Cretaceous diatom. Every every. The age. Wow, very cool. Yes. Thank you. I mean, I didn't know much about diatoms other than hearing the word. Uh, given the extent of pollution in the water bodies and rivers and lakes and so on, especially in Bangalore, for example, how are they affected? I mean, you talk about bioindicators. Can you speak a little bit about that and to what extent we can try and ameliorate or mitigate uh, the impact on these? Sure. So uh, from diatoms are like, uh, they are there everywhere. Like you can take it from minus 10 degree inside the ice or a boiling hot water spring. So just for a temperature, I'm just telling this range. So, but the, at every different uh, temperature, there is an assembly just completely changes. So, when we, why we use diatom as a bioindicator is because they are uh, based on the water quality condition, the, co the community, the assembly just changes. So, we use them as a, like, by looking at, we can tell that this water is a polluted water or a clean water or a, or a moderately polluted water in that way. And... Uh, most of the time, bioindicators gives a reliable, reliable pictures than a physical, chemical like nature of the water. For example, EPA use all their sites are monitored water chemistry plus diatoms. So the same thing with European Water Framework. Hmm. Uh, this, this is a paka layman's question, so don't laugh at me. Is when uh, quite often we come across diatom sheets on water which are iridescent, so, uh, has the size of the diatoms itself got to do anything with the kind of iridescent patterns that we get? The the what I'm saying is the diameter of the rings, the colored rings which you get, the bands, the width of the bands. Is it got anything to do with the diatom size? So the uh, I think if you are talking about bioluminescence and the I'm talking of refraction when uh, they are on the surface of the water. You see them like an oil film. So the oil film kind of thing is by multiple like diatoms and many other microorganisms. They all release some kind of storage material is uh, in form of lipids, fat. So that comes up. Oh, yes. Very interesting talk. Thank you so much. So uh, can sediment, lake sediments can be used to do some kind of profiling and uh, know like, you know, what lake has gone through in the past and yes. what was its situation? Like, uh, can you direct me to any of the work done in Indian context? So thank you. Uh, this uh, lake profiling work over period is known as paleolimnology, like limnology, study of lake paleolimnology. And then in India, only in Himalaya, some work has been done on diatoms, using diatom by John Small from uh, Canada, uh, Queen's University, Canada. But it's possible to do in India, but we don't have that many natural lakes. All our lakes are man-made lakes, so we desilt. So we, it's like deleting the CCTV footage. So all these archives get deleted. But if we have a natural lake, and then we can, we can do a profile. And we tried doing that in Erviculum. You know, we want to have to see the what is the impact of humans, uh, you know, where there is less disturbance, there is no chance of desiltation. But monsoon is a big, uh, very powerful even happen in Western Ghats. So the when we dated the entire sediments, so, you know, we got like on top level, we got 4,000 and then 1,000 and then 6,000. So one strong monsoon once in like, you know, 15, 20 years, like, you know, it, it, it puts entire things in upside down. But it's possible in doing in, in some of the northeastern natural lakes. <clears throat> you mentioned about uh, Powai Lake and the samples being collected for from Powai Lake by H. P. Gandhi. Did anybody went back now, like recently, and also looked at whether the diatoms diversity and abundance has changed? So we we visited uh, Powai Lake and Borivili streams and the Hisar ponds and like wherever. So except to Powai Lake, nothing else is there. So only Powai Lake is there where we can sample, nothing else is there. But Powai Lake, what Gandhi have seen and what we have seen is like completely two different pictures. And we use them for educating school kids for, you know, you see this 1947 diatom and 2020 diatoms. 
So, you know, completely different set of assembly issues. Yes. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on the award. Uh, my question is, uh, you talked about how diatoms uh, help with sustainable energy development of that. Could you shed some light on that? So diatoms uh, store their food material as a lipids. So whatever uh, the fish oil tablet which we take that's originally made by diatoms as omega-3 fatty acids. So diatoms are the original producer of omega-3 fatty acid. And apart from that, they're also source for a uh, lot of lipids which have potential for to run our car in future. And in fact, in, 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 many, in North America, there are many plants which make biofuel out of diatom cultures. Thank you. I mean, what fascinated me so much about diatoms was their amazing shape and structure. And uh, I'd love to spend some time taking pictures of them in your lab. Looking forward to having yeah. you, Sandish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik, for that fascinating talk on um, diatoms. And uh, I feel like I'm running out of diatoms in here. So let me just get a sip of water before we introduce our next speaker. Otherwise I'll lose my voice. I promise um, I haven't been traveling to China or anywhere. I only just came back from Vietnam. So our next uh, speaker, I owe an apology to before I call her onto the stage. I met her in uh, Washington DC and she was working on plants. And we at that time were working on a book about hummingbirds. Um, and uh, two of my sisters are artists for the book. And we were having a very difficult time finding the flowers of certain neotropical plant species that these hummingbirds fed on. And in that quest to try to find a botanist who could help take the hummingbirds to that next level, because we wanted to show the interaction. And that's what's most important is like, once you get past nomenclature, you want to get into the interactions of nature. And that's where the beauty of storytelling lies, is in the intricate interactions between species, between organisms, between birds, between flowers. And when we were having that problem, we reached out to Vinita. Vinita Gauda is, a, is a, now a principal investigator and associate professor. She's an evolutionary biologist. And as a botanist, her research focus on, focuses on understanding the evolution of floral and vegetative traits in plants, including the evolution of sex in plants using morphological, molecular, ecological, and behavioral tools. That's a mouthful. And she's going to come here and explain that in more detail. So Vinita is passionate about putting plants back in tropical forest studies in India, a subcontinent, a subcontinent which has a rich history and heritage in plant taxonomy, but which still lacks studies that focus on the evolutionary history of native flora. She's worked extensively in the neotropics, especially the Caribbean islands, where she studied the heliconia hummingbird interactions, and since has moved back to India in 2013. Please join me in welcoming Vinita Gauda to the stage. And as part of my apology for her, I have the book that she helped with. Thank you for your contributions. I've been wanting this book for several years. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Apologies for the delay. Yes. I was telling um, Sandesh that um, I don't know when we met. It was possibly 2008. Um, I had long hair. 
I had he, hair. And he had hair. <laughs> so that's how, how far back we go. All right, so um, to begin with, uh, congratulations, Karthik, again. Uh, it's you who brought us back uh, together. I met Karthik recently, but it's great to see him uh, succeed so well. And thank you, Atri, for this invitation and for this wonderful opportunity um, to talk about what I really love, uh, that is plants and evolution of plants. What I don't like is that you've given me only eight minutes, plus two, and I'm going to take that plus two. Um, it's a very, very dear uh, topic for me, which is why it's going to be very difficult for you to shut me out. So I'm going to try to condense all that I know in eight minutes, right? So I'm here to talk about uh, species and nature. And I'm going to hang on that first term species for most of the part. Uh, because that's where my focus is, the focus of my lab is. Um, so I'm at the, uh, the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Bhopal as Um, uh, so I'm at ISIL uh, right here. Um, uh, it's in uh, central uh, of the country in Bhopal, and we have several ISERs now spread out uh, across India. So for all the students and all the parents who are interested in sending their kids to higher education in basic sciences, please uh, come to ISIL Bhopal. We're a very good team, and uh, our, and 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 what we teach in science is really uh, quite world class. Um, so my lab is called the Tropical Ecology and Evolution Lab, same as A3, without the A part. Um, and, and I'm in the get-go, let me thank all my students, past and present, uh, past students, almost all outgoing students, and all the current PhD students who are working with me, and a huge sort of army of master students and interns who have gone through uh, my lab, some of them who are here in the, in the audience. And so I'll, let me thank them for everything that I'm going to show is pretty much their contribution. Um, also, thanks to all the funding agencies without which I wouldn't be here. Uh, unfortunately, the story that Karthik said is really, really, really unfortunate, especially for taxonomy, because people assume that we're just going to describe species and therefore, and all they need is a microscope and nothing else. Travel money is a very expensive uh, cost for most of us who do field work. Everyone who has done it knows it. Atri knows it very well. And so therefore, funds is as much an issue for us as it is for any molecular biologist. While a small antibody vial can cost one lakh, which most for most funds. Two students, which could mean hundreds and hundreds of specimens and possibly new species. So that's what we are comparing when it comes to funds. So definitely thanks to all the funding agencies who are here. Uh, so let me start with what is a species. As you all know, Karthik, we already talked about him describing species. The concept of describing species is not very simple, which is why we are honoring what he did and what most of us do here. Uh, in in biology, fundamentally, this is one of the biggest questions. One can say it's almost like for anyone who's a physicist or, or, or math person, this is what you may call an NP-hard problem. That is, it's really difficult to define this one terminology, which is why I have left it undefined. However, the one way we get around understanding a species is asking more fundamental and almost borderline philosophical questions of what is a species. So we go around in science in our labs asking questions of how are these species defined? How do we define this term species? And to define them, we may first want to know how are they created? So at what point will a taxonomist or a scientist say, yes, this is a new species and no, this is not a new species. You need some kind of a metric there, right? Because science is quantitative. Once we define it, we also ask the question of, can this species concept now change? Can an ex-scientist come in and say, no, I disagree with Vinita and therefore I'm going to rename it. Can this concept therefore change? And third one is once created, let's say it has it for, for, for about 100 years, no one has come around to change the name. Then the question becomes, can we talk about what is the maintenance of the species that was first defined? 
Now, again, this is almost borderline reasonably philosophical because we need to under identify what is a species. So the common example I give in my class is, let's say if a Martian came to, to Earth and was looking at us, it's possible that they will look at my sister and me as two different species because we are completely different behaviorally. We physically look very different. We behave different. Our interests are different, right? It's, the Martian may also look at a Southeast Asian as different from us Indians and a Caucasian as different. However, in our taxonomic form, we call all as homo sapiens, right? We do not even call certain uh, groups of sex as different species because of ethical issues. But the same sort of logic we do not use when it comes to non-human species in this matter. So that's how philosophical this question is of what is a species. So in some sense, once you define these questions, all of these questions, in a sense, you are describing what we call is this origin of diversity. And once you talk diversity, there are two terminologies that all of us have to discuss. One is what is taxonomy, and second is what is nomenclature. Now, taxonomy is defined as this idea of uh, scientific organization of species, like what, uh, or, or even living or dead, because we also organize fossils. Fossils also can be named. So you discover a new species of fossil and you name it. So the idea of nomenclature goes across whether you're living or dead organism as long as as long as it's and how are you going to organize it? You, you, you're going to use some kind of a nomenclature technique, which is again a scientific sort of a, 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 a method method that we use to identify the name, name it, and then sustain it, name it. Um, uh, who's been sort of called the father of, of nomenclature because of the uh, binomial nomenclature. There are other nomenclature methods that uh, I can't get into today, but it is important that naming pretty much defines and starts any science that we're doing today. So in a sort of very basic form, what do we taxonomists do? Imagine this is sort of a, 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 the kind of a, a image that you have in a kindergarten. One of the uh, sort of tests that people use to understand if a child is going through developmental um, uh, steps or, or, or the right sort of a form, they, you usually give to two-year-olds, one-year-olds, two-and-a-half-year-olds, these blocks with different designs, right? And they're scattered around and you ask the child to sort them. So you take this and now imagine these blocks are some kind of phenotypes and genotypes that we're looking for in a forest. The child will sort these, these blocks into possibly these four forms, that is there are triangles, circles, squares with round edges, and squares with sharp edges. So this is something that a two and a half, possibly even one and a half year old child can do, and the doctor will check mark and say, yes, developmental milestones sort of achieved. That's pretty much what we do in taxonomy to begin with. We take plants, we sort it, and we say pine-shaped plants, bamboo-shaped plants, you know, palm-like plants, uh, cactus-like plants, and trees. So that's the first step we do in terms of sorting. Reasonably straightforward. Of course, the morphology is very complex, which is why you need a little bit more complexities. We then name them. We call one section as possibly gymnosperms. We've named, gone ahead and named the rest as monocots and the rest of the last part here as dicots. Now comes the most interesting part where we kind of diverge from what I uh, explained to you for a one and a half year old is this arrow that you see between these different groups of plants. We're not just interested in what the name of the plant is or how we have classified it into separate groups. We're also interested in knowing how these species have evolved. So we're also interested in that arrow, that is how our species link to each other through ancestral sort of connections, that is how much of genotypes or genes they share so that we can say one is coming is is sort of a one species has led or, or, or has, uh, has is is um, uh, resulting in a different species. How species have split, how they may merge, how they may hybridize, and so on and so forth. So this arrow is pretty much what most of our labs do when we say that we are evolutionary biologists and we're looking for how species evolve. So this is pretty much what we do in the tree lab is ask the question what is a species and how it is maintained. What you're seeing here image is the 
complete polymorphic form. We call it floral polymorphism because the flowers are different. The plant looks the same. And so if you if I gave you a plant from the left side and the one on the right side, one if you were not sort of sure about it, you may call it two different species. If you came to my lab, we would call it all single species, which means that they're just different colored polymorphs of the same species. And this is a very, very complex problem in, in, uh, um, uh, in science. So what do we do now? We do in, 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 in uh, sort of identifying in our need to identify species or understand what a species is, we use what we call is integrative taxonomy, this idea where we take taxonomy, that is a name first, we then build a phylogenetic tree using molecules, morphology, or any kind of uh, 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 characters that you may have. And then we look at different aspects, such as character evolution, age of the group, where the species originated. And then we it all ties up back into the taxonomy. That is, we really go back into saying, what was the name of the species? Was it really correct? If not, we go back and check it and, and recorrect it, uh, adjust it, and so on and so forth. So this is a cyclical process. We keep going as more and more data comes through, next-gen sequ uh, sequencing, genome sequencing. We just throw it in, and so our ideas of what is a species evolves. And I call it sort of the taming of the taxonomic dragon. And this image was made by one of my ex-interns who is somewhere here in the audience, Athara. And um, I call it the taming of the dragon. And you can see here that the, the head of the dragon has been replaced by one of the most monstrous flower in my lab, which is called the Hedicum spicatum. The reason we have put it there is because this particular plant, which looks very benign like, like this in the end, is, is is actually quite scary for most of us. Why? Because we are unable to put this particular species in any specific box because of the way it behaves in terms of the morphological variations it has. So we call it the dragon. And as of now, there have been four PhD students, in fact, five PhD students who spent only on looking at this one species, its species complexes. Each student is five years, so you can do your maths. That's the amount of time we've spent in I, trying to figure out one species and its complex. The complex has seven other species. I'm not going to go into how, how complex, uh, how difficult that is. And there's another complex that is, we've now discovered, which of course my uh, other two students are also working on. So this is sort of what we look at is the complexity of species because it helps us understand how we are defining species, how new species are being formed and where we are going with this in terms of the diversity. So for the last five, 15 years that I've been working on plants and, and, and plant evolution and systematics, I'll just give you a summary of, in one slide of what we have discovered. And, uh, I know this, this may uh, sound sort of scandalous, but this is pretty much what it is. Uh, our first discovery is that sexual promiscuity is really key to diversity. And that's what we have learned from all the species complexes. What is the sexual promiscuity? That is plants can hybridize across their uh, different species. They can mate with anything that is nearby. It adds complexity in the genes that we're looking for creates new morphologies. So as long as the neighbor is, is something that the plant can mate with, you're going to find extreme hybrid zones. So in the Northeast where we work, there are kilometers, which we call as hybrid zones. We just look at it and say hybrid zone, not touching it because every species there is, is going to be molecularly similar, but morphologically very, very different. And this is what we have found, what creates the diversity that we have in the Northeast of India. The second is that the opposite of exactly what I said, that there is a lot of diversity in similarity, such as our stories from this uh, floral color morphs. You can see here the first one are all uh, impatiens uh, from Western Ghats, where you can see the very small form and the very large form are still all the same species. Same thing with the curcuma in the bottom, the white form and the pink form all are the same species. So in some sense, this is where we are at a crossroad that at one point I'll say, uh, species are, are morphologically very distinct. And on the other side, I'll say, and, and, and therefore um, they should be called different species. On the other hand, I'll say, even distinct morphologically looking taxa should still be called the same name. And, and these two opposing statements are still correct, which is what we sort of are, have now arrived at, at least in plant taxonomy and systematics, that it's okay to be different and it's okay to be using different definitions to describing what we call as a species. Um, and uh, one of the good examples of this promiscuity is this one clade that we uh, find here in this one large group of plant species. These are the hedicums or the, what we call as ginger lilies in, in, uh, and its highest taxonomic diversity in, is in India. 
And we, what we found when we ran, ran this phylogenetic analysis is that the highest diversity is in this one clade called the fourth clade. The number doesn't matter. What matters is that this entire clade is, is dominated by the Indian uh, taxa. And this is also the species or the clade where there's hyper hyper diversity and hyper hybridization in the wild, which is why you can see that the total number of species that is added in that clade is very, very large. Um, so coming back to where and how we go about discovering these new species uh, uh, in terms of the methodology is very simple. We use morphology, ecology, genetics, and it's pretty much a combination of all of these three that you have to use hand in hand for you to identify what we call as, a, as new species, no trivial task. Where are we now? Those previous three steps are reasonably very well known. Where we have now progressed is, of course, we also use all these nice buzzwords like machine learning. We use the morphologies to identify characters that will help us identify these clusters, what we call as species. So we use now reasonably high end computational work to identify morphologies, to identify clusters, to identify what we call as a new species. And we also sort of use now chemical ecology to look at floral scents to see if the scents may be different between the species and maybe the scent will help us identify because clearly the pollinators are using the scents to go to different plants. So in terms of the taxonomy, there is no end uh, to what method you could use to identify new species. It's, it's an open world. The method is never the limiting force. And where are the new species? I think um, um, uh, uh, in the beginning, we talked about where one can go uh, and Sandesh mentioned it as well. And I strongly believe that the only uh, two things that can be limiting to where we explore and where we find new species is your uh, idea of how far you are willing to explore and how far you're willing to take the risks. And I agree with what Sandesh read about uh, David Attenborough, how he mentioned that in the tropics, it's really you can find new species. It's basically, however, the the sort of uh, the scientist or the uh, quantitative way of defining it, which is really missing and not necessarily the absence of species. Um, so coming back, I'm uh, sort of on my last few slides, uh, the theme of today's sort of uh, uh, function and the whole meeting was uh, to discuss how taxonomy or how naming is a very important sort of a feature in, in our current science. And I, I strongly believe that our understanding of, of life and diversity uh, starts with this, what we call taxonomy. That is uh, when uh, this is one of the fields where it's very Interestingly, our only time when we can play God, because as a taxonomist, we create species and we resolve, dissolve the species, right? This is the only time when you can do this is create something when you create something new and you're still not harming any a single soul. So a very, very powerful sort of a, a, a system where we can work with. And of course, all is fun in the scientific world until, of course, the family splits. And it's a cartoon that shows um, two fish in the bottom sort of discussing why the top three fishes look very sad because the family has been split and the new, uh, you know, a new genus has been erected and now the family is split into two different genera. A very sort of, you know, uh, taxonomic joke. I hope you, you, you enjoy it. Uh, but we really like to split things and make everyone sort of ruffle the feathers, as we say. Uh, and with this, I'll, I'll end. And like I said, uh, taming the dragons or taxonomic dragon is something that we, many of us are very proud about uh, because everything begins uh, with a name. Of course, uh, some are more fun and also uh, to tame in terms of the taxonomic work uh, than others. And it's those tough dragons that we sort of try to tame in my lab where we look at species complexes and really ask the fundamental question, what is a species? Um, so thank you, everybody. I'll just take this opportunity to announce as well. I think most of you already know the ATBC meeting is coming to um, India next year. It will be held in Coimbatore. Uh, of course, last time it was here, it, A3 was a big part for it. And of course, it will. I'm sure it will be this year as, uh, in the next year as well. Uh, so please uh, take a note of it. Thank you very much. Vinita only gets asked one question. So whoever raises their hand up first. Yes. Sorry to ask this tough questions kind of. Uh, with the advance of technology, 
we are going to get uh, identified species in the field, uh, like in the laboratory. But when a person gets into the field and he wants to like, at the end of the day, is all the uh, energy or entertainment you have in the field, not in the lab. So how does all the technological advancement help somebody to identify a species in the field, not in the lab? Hmm. How does someone help? How does the technological, I mean, are you, are you referring to things like apps? No. Ah, okay. Well, so, okay. Uh, in the field, so the idea is this, that what we do in the lab uh, has to translate to the field, right? Because, I mean, me telling you that there's an ATG sort of, you know, addition in, in the chloroplast genome at whatever point is not going to help someone in the field. So we are very, very cognizant of that. In fact, that's why I kept talking taxonomy. Um, no matter how much molecular work you do, at the end of the day, the naming of the species still is a morphological uh, event. We still have to find morphologies to describe it. So you, uh, more recently, when we have described new species, what we have done is uh, we've taken the molecular tool and, and checked it again and again that it is indeed a new species. And the idea is to use what we call as corroborative data, that you're not going to use only morphology or only molecules, you use all combined data. So the lab work is really to add that confidence to what we call as a species. But then we always go back to the morphology and describe it because there is no way anyone can publish, at least in botany, without actually identifying. So what happened, this is there's a concept called cryptic species. That is you, your molecule said it's a new species, but you morphological, you can't tell it apart. But then since the molecules are saying it again and again, so you go back to the, to the plant and you say, where is that morphology? And interestingly, oftentimes we find it. So it's sort of like a give and take. There is no same linear line of how we work. It's really a circular, we kind of keep going back and forth. And there's nothing called a wrong thing. If it was a wrong species, someone will sink it. If it's not, someone will split it. So it happens all the time here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. So we've gotten through the infinite variety of diatoms. We've gotten through um, the diversity of plants and interactions. And what we need to do next, of course, is take what we know into nomenclature and, and machine learning, what you mentioned, is like being able to take a photograph of something in the field, uploading it, and then the name pops up, right? Citizen science, that's where things are at right now. I mean, I don't know the names of so many beetles, plants, insects, and whatever it is. You take a picture, you upload it, and that's what this entire collective multiplied many fold with all your other people that you know, members of our community that can contribute to science and make it exponential. And that's where things are at right now, to be able to use technology, harness technology, and take it to the next level. And to help us guide us in this process, we have Praveen, who's a citizen science enthusiast who loves to work with large birdwatcher groups and upscale the limits of citizen science contribution in understanding our birds. He works with the Bird Count India program in Nature Conservation Foundation, acting as a liaison with other scientists and wildlife biologists. He likes to meddle with avian systematics and understand their biogeography. He co-maintains the National Checklist of Birds of India and is presently working on expanding it to the synopsis of Birds of India. He's an associate editor with India Birds Journal and represents South Asia in the team of two world checklists of birds, the Howard and Moore and the IOC. In his past life, he was a computer engineer by training and he's worked in the software tech industry. Good evening, everyone. Um, congratulations, Karthik. And, uh, Great talk by Vinita. So a lot of things are already cleared. So my work is much more simpler to explain. Okay. 
I think the slides are okay. Yeah, so I've been asked to talk about science, species and citizen science. So I had to marry two concepts which has not been married yet, I think. I don't know whether I'll be able to marry them, but I will try to at least take them to an engagement level. So let me start. Taxonomy anarchy hampers conservation. So this is an article which appeared in Nature in 2017 by two leading uh, though it's titled as a generic article, it's a case study on birds. And I think the entire article was about some anarchy in bird taxonomy. Let me explain a bit more what it means. So this, let's take a crow, large bill crow. I'm sure that all of you know that there are two crow species, one with a gray neck, which is a house crow. The one with the black neck, which is a large bill crow. So that's roughly the distribution of large bill crow. But it doesn't look like everyone agrees how many species of large bill crow occurs in India. There are authorities, there are books which say there's only one species, while there are the authorities, for example, Wikipedia, which will say there are three species. And here you communicate to a kid that, yes, we saw a large bill crow, and then the kid goes back and checks Wikipedia. Oh, come on, that's only found in Himalayas. So that's the kind of anarchy which is manifold in different species across geographies, which I'm going to talk about. So to tell you a little more about the context, I have to tell you the story of world checklists. So there are like four different world authorities in, the, in birds, There's not one, four different authorities. So it started with like Howard and Moore, which is kind of considered the most authority one. It updates like once in a decade, uh, very slow for a taxonomy, like once in a decade updates. but considered very authoritative, last one was in 2014. The next one is a eBird or the Clemens checklist. A different start point, somewhere in America, there was a world checklist done by Clemens, which was acquired by Cornell and integrated with their ecosystem of eBird and that became the eBird Clemens taxonomy, updated annually. And it is probably the one where the taxonomic decisions are well documented to what is changing this year. Another start point, somebody started saying that we need standard English names. And when they started that, they realized that, hey, there has to be a taxonomy behind it. There has to, we have to first know what species we are talking about. So they invented a new taxonomy that became IOC taxonomy, updated twice a year, but we have the third taxonomy now. Then BirdLife International came into picture. Hey, we are losing a lot of species. Taxonomies are going very slow. We need something very quick. We need a rule of thumb, like um, you, you start scoring, uh, morphology, acoustics, and sometimes genetics, score it, give some points, and you reach seven, ah, yeah, this is a species. Uh, it looked a little controversial, a lot of taxonomics wrote into it, but IUCN has adopted it, and they came out with a fantastic book of illustrated world checklist. So a lot of investment has gone into that taxonomy also. So now we have four different authorities and Slightly after the article by the Australians, people started realizing that something need to be done. So a few people came together and at least looked at one particular bird group, birds of prey, uh, the eagles as well as the owls. And they found that, yeah, there is a lot of taxonomic congruence between them, but still a lot of discordance. It's about 10 to 25% species are different in one particular bird group. And if you, if you really look at deeper, they are all in the tropics. The differences are all in the tropics. Temperate, temperate countries, more or less great alignment. And they came together and formed what is known as a WGAC, a working group on IVN taxonomies under the IOU. And three of the taxonomies have aligned that they work towards a common taxonomy. Fantastic progress made in the last two years because of COVID. Nobody could travel. They are all working from their homes. But I don't know what will happen in the next two years. Hopefully, we will probably have one integrated taxonomy here. And then we probably can look at something which is more easier to manage when we are communicating with the larger audience. Meanwhile, in India, uh, we were grappling with the four different taxonomies. We started with the Howard and Moore because that was the latest in 2016 when we did it. And then we started going to consensus-based approach, like looking at all, all the other three taxonomies and seeing which of them align and then taking a decision to split or lump based on what the other three taxonomies are saying. Now we are moving in that direction, hopefully at some point in time, we will be able to move to the WGAC checklist. So why, why it's so important? So this is, this is just an animation of the locations where people are birding in India using the eBird. 
So see the number of people who are burning and they cross India and that, that, that doesn't have an India map. Those are all lighted based on localities where people have been burning. So that's a density of burning which is happening and they actually need to know what species we are talking about. And fantastic outputs come out of it. They, this, is, this is okay, this is something really uh, not very uh, up to date, but still it's a pied cuckoo known as a harbinger of monsoon in Northern India. People were trying to figure out whether it's actually the case. Is the pied cuckoo arriving just before the monsoon? And it seems that once you put the meteorological data on top of the sightings, it looks like, like pied cuckoo is just ahead of the monsoon. Eh? It's, it's basically actually reaching the villages and telling that yes, monsoon is down the way. So there are fantastic information coming out of the citizen science initiatives. Something more serious, BirdLife International with the national partners like BNHS has produced this what is called AV step for green energy, uh, sensitivity zone. So they're using the eBird data as a backbone. They are able to draw a square and tell what is the sensitivity of say onshore wind project on collisions to a set of species. So things are moving in a direction where it's quite beneficial for the society. And that's where we need them to come together. The one which is there in Wikipedia, which is the largest uh, 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 the online public encyclopedia. Uh, one of the largest citizen science endeavors, eBird, and one of the largest conservation organizations, which is IUCN, to talk the same lingua franca, come on the same table and at least have a same way so that policy, citizen science, science communication can actually have a common language. And some contributions from citizen science, for example, Senakanta is a wonderful database of AV, AV sounds, nature sounds, and has got good recordings of birds. And every year about 20 papers come out in taxonomy worldwide. They look at uh, audio and most of them come from Seno Kandu. And Macaulay Library, where there is more than sounds, there is video, there is images, and the largest database of bird, bird, bird images from a Asia, which is oriental bird images have been merged into Macaulay Library. Fantastic resource out of which outputs are actually coming. The group of citizen scientists actually sat together and looked at black-breasted beaver or Bengal beaver. It is used to be a monotypic species, like there are no subspecies to it. Looked at it, Yes, there are two different forms, a black face form and a white face forms. And there is a geography associated with it. There is clearly a geography. There is something happening out there. It's a time for molecular systematics to step in and see what is happening here. Are there subspecies? Are there species? Are they uh, integrating? So there is knowledge out there which is coming out through citizen scientists. The scientists are actually actually looking at the sand lakes in Gujarat. There was a subspecies, which is, I mean, in birds, we have a subspecies concept. So we have a subspecies which is described as uh, uh, from a small region of Bhavanagar. Specimens identified. There is a variation, but when they looked at the, the photographs which they had and the large database in the citizen science uh, landscape, they found that these kind of variations are there across Gujarat and it's just freely intermingling with the real local form which is Adams. So this is a paper in print. It is going to come up in the next issue of Indian Birds, but that's another contribution from citizen science. Somewhere where I was involved, uh, this is where we actually try to uh, exp explore a little more what Rasmus and Anderton told in, in like 2012 that the Malabar flame back, which is found in the Western Ghats, has got a different call, different acoustics. We looked at the contact calls, flight calls, and uh, or even the tapping. And also including the Sri Lankan form. And interestingly, Sri Lankan form is already a new species because it's morphologically very different. And when you look at the Himalayan form and the Western Ghats form, you, you look at the, 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 the graph which is here, the, the top one. The top one is the Malabar flying back. It's an it's a inter interval between the taps. So the taps are very steady for Malabar flying back, while for the greater flying back and the crimson, crimson back flying back, it accelerates. So though morphologically similar, the Malabar fly, flying back is vocally very distinct. It's not just for the tap sounds, it's also for the contact calls, it's also for the flight calls that Malabar flying back is quite distinct from the other two forms. So interesting things which have come up from citizen science database. I would like to end with hey, something, hey. some kind of an interesting, hey. some, some, some kind of interesting uh, aspect here, a uh, group which actually went to what corner in Arunachal Pradesh climbed for two days and uh, in the rain, they went looking for a gray-bellied wren dabbler, which apparently is only known from one corner of India. And they did not find gray-bellied wren dabbler there. They found something else altogether. It doesn't sound like gray-bellied wren dabbler at all. It doesn't look like that. It doesn't have a gray belly also. It is probably more closer to Naga wren dabbler, but there are still differences here. So there is something interesting happening out there. 
and feel free to actually if you are already applying for a permit in Arunachal Pradesh, try to just include one more taxa, see and sample it molecular and see what's happening there. There potentially is either a species or a subspecies just hanging out there in those hills. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Praveen. That led perfectly into our next session. But um, we do have time for one quick question for Praveen from anyone out there. Okay, so um, uh, I must say that we are now going to be talking a lot about citizen science and the best part about it is no one has to be an expert to join this army of citizen scientists. So thank you. Now the much awaited moment where Arvin gets to embarrass me for a few minutes. <laughs> well, Sandesh doesn't require any introduction. Everybody knows. Okay. Uh, but it's very small proportion here may not know Sandesh Prabhu. Hmm. <clears throat> Sandesh is a National Geographic uh, fellow and explorer, internationally acclaimed filmmaker and photographer. His first documentary, The Mountains of the Monsoons, is a spectacular document of drama of Nilgiri Thar, which the world witnessed for the first time. What a uh, amazing documentary for Sandesh. Really, we like this. <clears throat> More recently, his Wildcats of India series is just out of the world and it's beyond our imagination, the way you shot, the way you bought out the private life of the uh, wild cat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if you have seen, if not seen that uh, documentary, please do. It's just amazing. He also uses print medium for storytelling. Uh, the coffee table book, the Western Guards and the Himalayas co-authored with Professor, Professor Kamaljit Bhava, uh, who is the president of Atri, and both of these books today stand as a reference uh, to how coffee table books should be and read. Personally, I had a privilege to travel with you uh, during the uh, recently concluded biodiversity exploration in Siang Valley of Arunachal Pradesh. He is keen observer and a great naturalist. And over to you, Sasandesh, uh, and you are the one of the best storyteller of India in the recent uh, time. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Arvind. Thank you so much. So I, I'm very, very aware that we are running a little bit behind time. They hurry up, but he's probably busy cooking turkey right now or preparing to cook a turkey for Thanksgiving. So we can take a few extra minutes. Um, you mentioned the Sahyadis documentary, and I think Karthik also mentioned that exactly during Thanksgiving, probably in what, 2008 or something, yeah. or 2010, uh, he was downloading on a torrent site, my Sahyadi's documentary at Thanksgiving. <clears throat> but I must say that the world has become more open now. You have citizen science, you have, uh, now you can actually watch documentaries much more easily with a subscription. So you don't have to be doing torrenting and downloading uh, things nefariously. So without further ado, I'd like to start um, our journey with the mountains of life, which is the Himalaya. So I had the privilege in 2012 or 2009, when I started the journey with Professor Bawa in Sikkim. Uh, after the first book, The Western Ghats, I said, no more books. I'm done with it. I lost half my hair working with you. I'm not going to work with you again. But he convinced me in his very convincing way. And we went to Gurudongmar, which is the cover image of the book. And at 17,000 feet, he asked again, would you like to work on a book about the Himalaya? In that rarefied thin air, I gave the wrong answer. I said, yes. And there went another five years in the mountains. And I don't regret one bit of it because it taught me a lot. And we worked on several documentaries during that time. And we came out with this book, 
in 2012. And in the process of working on this book, I came across an account by the British in 1911, 1912. So in 2012, here I am working on Himalaya Mountains of Life. A small part of India, the Siang Valley. And the Siang Valley is the source of the river Brahmaputra. And it comes in from Tibet. So geographers during that time had always thought the Yarlung Sangpo going across Lhasa, across Tibet at 4,000 meters was a very different river to the Siang River, which was coming into India. It was around this time that they actually realized that the Siang and the Yarlung Sangpo are the same river. It cuts a valley so deep, it's almost five vertical miles in depth, the deepest gorge on the planet, which is the Siang. And the other deep gorge on the planet is also in the Himalaya. That's the Kali Gandaki Gorge in Nepal, central Nepal. But this valley had a story. And that story was about scientific discovery. So the British went in their, in, their, in, their, in their huge expedition manner. And not only did they go and um, quell a rebellion that had started there, it was actually a punitive expedition. They also went with a team of zoologists that cataloged every single frog, mollusk, fish, bird, reptile, you name it, they caught it, then they named it. And they made an account called the Zoological Results of the Abor Expedition between 1911 and 1922. So we are at the cusp of that 2022, 100 years later. So I thought this was a great idea to do a story. And little did I know that my colleagues at Atri, uh, uh, Ganesan and Arwin and a few other folks were actually working on doing a smaller expedition to the same place. So I said, why have competition with my family here? So we made it a bigger expedition by bringing them all on board and doing a science and storytelling uh, expedition. And we are going to continue doing this for the next couple of years. So this is the Siang. Siang itself means the heart of water. Si means mother, Ang is river, and si and heart Mother and heart have the same word in the Adi language. So we went on this expedition, 20 members. Uh, some folks went before the main expedition and some of the folks have just finished another one and just come back. But like many of these big endeavors, it takes a lot of support. And we're very thankful for National Geographic Society uh, for supporting the whole expedition. And we got in-kind support from Cool and from uh, Isuzu for helping us actually get into these remote landscapes. So I'll show you a small piece of that video. But one of our most significant findings was also one of the most significant findings from a hundred years ago. Who knows what this is? Okay, were you on the expedition? Okay, all right, you're welcome to the next one. <laughs> but this is a very interesting species. It's a velvet worm in the genus Onychophora. And this is the only one of its kind known in the subcontinent. And the fact that we discovered it again after a hundred years of it not being around is something that we are all very proud of. And this is also the importance of interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary expeditions. One team can help the other. Now this poor creature doesn't belong to any one of the teams. So it's going to get a special write-up and a special note all to itself. Uh, and this was discovered, I think, by Ranjit, who then came and said, what kind of funny worm is this? And then we realized that this is the most significant finding from a century ago, and we're very lucky to find this one specimen. So we had our team. I don't have pictures of everyone here. So we found a whole variety of mollusks and insects and, and amazing botanical marvels like that Rafflesia. Sapria Himaliana, and also Nilanjan, one of our team members, went looking for fish. And this is kind of like the story of the diatoms, right? What you don't see doesn't exist. And although fish are larger in size, they too don't exist because no one looks underwater. 
But when you do put your head under water and you look inside, there is a staggering diversity of life. Amazing species of fish, many of which still need a name. And that's how much at its infancy science is in that remote part of India. And there's still a lot of work to be done to put names to many of these species. And that's what the scientists, uh, everyone who's come back from the expedition are busy doing, is trying to figure out names for the animals. And in Praveen talk, we learned about citizen science. And I mentioned, you don't really have to be an expert to be able to find, you know, put names. I mean, you need to be an expert to put a name to it, but you don't need to be an expert to marvel at the diversity of species out there. So this is Priya and there's Ranjit. So Priya is not a person who studies moths, but she's been able to put together a whole assortment of moth um, specimens, photographs. And I think she's identified 450 plus species from this expedition. And she's not a moth expert. So this just takes a little bit of interest to go out of your expertise. Maybe you're a mammalogist, but then you're looking at moths. Or it's a hobby that can be turned to the next level. And that's where real species discovery happens when you're passionate about th the things that you're out looking for. And I think um, uh, Ranjit and Priyan's team are going to find probably the most number of new species. Uh, Priyan was there every night picking at every little uh, parasitoid wasp that you could find. And I love this image of him at work. And also a lot of new discovery happens in places most people don't look at. And that's high up in the canopy. So we did one preliminary trip into the canopy. This one's going to require another concerted effort because the canopy is the last frontier. It is the hidden frontier. It's out of reach to most of us, difficult to get there. But what you find in the canopy, you will not find anywhere else. And that's where the next pushing the boundary of science is all about. And that's what we're here for. We're here to push each other, to combine our knowledge and push the boundary of science so that we can find new species and help conserve what we all love. Without diatoms, we can't breathe. Without these rainforests, there won't be water, there won't be fresh water, and there won't be any oxygen. And so we really need to know what we have before many of these places get destroyed. And unfortunately, a lot of these places were already on the road to destruction. As a matter of fact, a dam being planned in the Siang could destroy that entire diversity of the landscape before we even put a name to it. So our endeavor is to combine science and storytelling. And I have a short video here, which is just a small trailer about what we're working on in order to make something impactful that can convince governments and change policy by combining science and powerful storytelling. So here's a short film. <laughs> Look at that! That's a monocle cobra. I'm blessed today to see this plant. Ah, it's smelling. Come on, no, whoa! Did you see that?
something very interesting here. I believe exploration is led by a deep-rooted curiosity for the natural world. Okay. Oh. And that curiosity is driven by a hunger for knowledge and by a hunger for answers. This is crab beetle. The larvae feeds on the dead wood. That combination of curiosity with passion is what drives us to explore further, to go beyond the places we've ever been and find things that will arouse curiosity and inspire conservation. That's what exploration is all about. <laughs> we can eat? Ta? Ka sakta hai na? Ka sakta hai na? Peanut night. Peanut taste. Mm. Here, which is the eastern, the east, the uh, eastern direction. Poor, poor. Yeah. Well, how to ask him the eastern direction? <laughs> Thank you all. So I, I was at the Kushu event in uh, 2013, I think it was, when the Dalai Lama spoke and. Um, we presented the book about the Himalaya to the Dalai Lama. And uh, one of the things that he mentioned the most through his talk, or what his talk was throughout that time, was the importance of humor in storytelling. Right? I think we as scientists sometimes get a little bit too serious. Not we as in me as a scientist, as in, in general. I'm not a scientist. Um, but what I try to do is I try to work with scientists in order to bring in the spirit of entertainment in order to engage the audience to help protect our environment. So, thank you all. So, we're kind of running out of time. So, if uh, there's no questions for me, we can um, skip to the next part of the program. And if there are questions, I'm always around to answer them. Okay. So, um, as we as we uh, speed along here, now this is another very important part of this evening. It's a felicitation for PhD awardees, and to to do this, I'd like to call on Siddharth Krishnan, who's an environmental sociologist and historian. He's affiliated to Atri's Center for Biodiversity and Conservation. He's also the convener of the Academy of Conservation Science and Sustainability Sciences Studies. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, so welcome again uh, to the Academy uh, Student Felicitation Site Event 2022. So this year, congratulations are in order uh, to Dr. Manish Kumar and Rahul Murlidharan. Manish was supervised by Dr. Jagdish Krishnaswamy and Rahul by Dr. Nitin Rai. Uh, so quickly about your work, uh, shortly, uh, Manish employs uh, eco-heterological framework to address the lacunae in uh, climatic and regional data on understanding linkages and feedback between vegetation, climate and spring and stream water in the Sikkim Himalayas. Now his central thesis, if I may, is that the positive impact of warming and increased moisture on forest productivity is likely to be offset by reduced sunlight availability, right? And further, a likely shift in peak forest productivity window to warmer winters along with reduced snowfall will induce significant water stress in forest ecosystems in Sikkim. Now, Rahul, uh, Dr. Ron Muridharan adopts a political ecological perspective to study nature society relations in the Park Bay and the Gulf of Manar in Ramanadapuram in Tamil Nadu. Emphasizing the material qualities of the sea, his dissertation illustrates the nexus of conservation, intensification, and securitization in a marine context and its impacts on 
artisanal fisheries and biodiversity. Now, this central thesis, again, if I may, is that fluid materiality of the sea deeply influences interactions among the various human and non-human uh, actors and is essential to understand the political ecology of marine conservation. Now, may I request Professor Balram to come on stage, please, followed by the awardees. Uh, so Rahul is here. I think Manish has just joined a postdoc in Birmingham recently, like a couple of days ago. And I, who will receive the award on his behalf, maybe a junior student, Ranjit. Rahul? So the memento itself is some embroidered work from uh, the Pachoral Toda community in the Nilgiris. Manish is here. Hi, Manish. Uh, yeah, so uh, Ranjit, can you receive the memento on uh, Manish's behalf? Thank you. So thanks, Manish and Ranjit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, so, like I said, um, it's very important in order to entertain, in order to engage. Now, to introduce the final part of the evening, I'd like to please call upon Raj Kushu to um, tell us what entertainment we have in store for this evening and something that will really leave every, everyone energized. Nobody can beat you in entertainment, my man. No. Uh, this uh, last program here, where is uh, Jaya, Jaya Peter? Yeah, where is, go ahead, please. So uh, we were putting this program together and the two things happened simultaneously. One was my boss at home, Preeti, said, why isn't there some music? Because people got addicted to Ricky Cage and that program was such a success in terms of. <clears throat> and the second, next day I get a call from Jaya saying that we have this artist from Rajasthan that uh, can play. I said, you know, this is killing two birds with one stone. Make domestic life happy, make atri life happy. So <laughs> a little bit about what inter introduced him these Manganyars. Can anybody tell me in South Asia, how many systems of folk music are there? Guess. One guess. Pardon? It's, 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 it's almost over 100. Folk singing, according to Wikipedia, et cetera, says it <clears throat> began in 1600 BC. But really, folk singing is as age old as civilization itself. And folk singing is down to earth. It is about the earth. It is about the spirituality. Dr. Koshu was very particular about music. And he taught, uh, he, he inculcated music in our DNA right from childhood. He grew up in Punjab and Punjab music, as you know, is boisterous. And today when you go to weddings, you see this Indian freestyle Bollywood dance. I mean, that's all, uh, you know, its roots are there. Uh, when you go to Kashmir, there are four systems of music. And one of them is Sufiana. We would in winters listen and he would make us listen to Sufi music, which is agnostic of religion, is agnostic of <clears throat> faith. So folks, folk music has one tremendous quality, which I discovered after I uh, went to USA. It is a-religious, it is a-spiritual, excuse me, and it talks about human life and the basis. Now, while classical Indian music is a genre by itself, but folk music is something that you will enjoy. This is the family of, this is a whole Rajasthani. There are four systems of music in Rajasthan. 
and you will have the whole Khan family here. We should bring them out and set them up. They're gonna entertain you with uh, what has been turned by our A3 communication as the Bard of the Dunes, right? They come from a particular area in Rajasthan. So please, we should bring them on and uh, set them up. You are in for a treat. They will sing songs from, they will take requests. They will sing songs from Bulle Shah, as you know, in Southern Sin. They will sing songs from Kabir. They have their own renditions and uh, a very unique set of instruments. What I like about them is that Kartal that uh, you, 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 you'll see. So you're in for a treat. It's hard to remember their known name, but they are all Manganyars and all are Khans. But extremely familiar with all the cultures. Now, one of the things that has happened to them is internet and uh, media has helped take this out of Rajasthan into the whole world. So would you welcome Amangani. Namaskar. Adab. Salam. Manganya community from Jaisalmer, Badme district. Se. Baut, baut shukriya. Aap sabko ki aap asif liyaye hume sunne ke liye. हमारे राजस्थान में मंगनियार कम्युनिटी एक फोक म्यूजिक कम्युनिटी हमारा परंपरायिक जो कल्चर का वो संगीत ही है और हमारे संगीत में हमारे गुरु मार्गदर्शक हमारी माँ माँ से ही संगीत सीखे हम और उसके बाद आज Seventh generation musician, sixteenth generation, eighteenth generation, Pidi Dar Pidi, Amara Sangit Chala, or Amara Sangit Ku Jivit Rakne Vale, Amara Pentress, Amara Zazman, Rasput, Hindu, Jati Sage Yonkarte. Aja Pom Sonani Jare, Wom, first song, Kesaria Balam, welcome song, Avoni Padaro Marades, Toske Upper Rize Khan, Rose Khan Manganyar. बहुत ही अच्छे गाने वाले और इन्होंने वर्ल्ड में कोने कोने में शो किया है और हमारा एक शो है तो मंगनिया सिलेक्शन उनको आप लीड वोकलिस्ट है और उस्ताद दरे खान जी के लड़के हैं कमाचा एक हमारे इंस्ट्रूमेंट जो बहुत ही पुराना बहुत ही पुराना आज से 500 600 साल पहले इनकी दुकान अहमदाबाद में थी अब कोई दुकान नहीं है इनको बनाने वाले भी नहीं है 
एक हमीरा गांव में कारपेंटर है तो उस्ताद लेट पदम श्री साकर खान साहब ने उनको बोला कि ये कमा चालू हो रहा है तो इनको बनाने के लिए उस कारपेंटर के पास आपने अपना टाइम निकाल कर उनके पास बैठ करके उनको सिखाया कि ऐसे बनाना है तो वो कारपेंटर आज वो हमारा कमाचा बना रहा है तो उस्ताद लेट पदम श्री साकर खान साहब के लड़के दरे खान साहब साकर खान के पोते ग्यावर खान के लड़के लतीफ खान दादे खान जी मंगनियार और साकर खान पदमश्री के दोते सवाई खान और साकर खान जी के मैं वाणिज देव खान तो आपके इजाजत चाहते हम वेलकम सो आवो नी पधारो मारे देश केसरिया वालों उसके बाद हम थोड़ा सा संगीत को लेके जाएंगे पेड़ पौधों के ऊपर थोड़ा सा उसके बाद अगर आप चाहे तो फरमाइशी कर सकते हैं तो हम आपका फरमाइश इन शाह हम पूरी करेंगे और उसके बाद हम चले जाएंगे थोड़ा हमारा राजस्थानी ट्रेडिशनल फोक में चले जाएंगे जो भवाई डोडा जांगड़ा पेठा हमारे गाने हैं उसके अंदाज में चले जाएंगे उसके बाद थोड़ा सूफी फिर थोड़ा मनोरंजन पे आ जाएंगे चाहता हूं सबसे
मेरा जीरा मेरा वो मैं बुरा पर से फिर मार जी गए मारी बुरा पर से
आपको कमाचा का सोलो सुनाने जा रहे हैं जो हमारा सास कमाचा उनका आपको सोलो सुनाते हैं कमाचा में राग सुहब
टाइम की वजह से नहीं तो मैं डोलक हड़ताल का जुगलबंदी अलग से करता लेकिन टाइम नहीं है तो डोलक का हड़ताल का इसके साथ जुगलबंदी भी कर लेते थोड़ा अब आपको सुना रहे हैं नींबूड़ा छाप तिलक मोरी छीन और दमा दम मस्कर अंदर
Sufia 
How about another round of applause?
that was really incredible. I was On? Okay. It's probably because I've, I've lost my voice listening to that amazing music. But um, more importantly, I think what we must realize right now is from the comfort of your seats, you've been transported from the depths of water, learning and appreciating about diatoms, traveling across vegetational zones, going across the valley of the Siang in Arunachal Pradesh and touching on the incredible cultural fabric of Rajasthan. So you've been on a journey and I hope all of you appreciate that. And one thing for any journey, there's a lot of work behind the scenes that goes on. So I'd like to call upon Asmita to please deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Sandesh. Sandesh is in fact one of the very first people that I need to thank tonight for taking us through the entire evening. But I'm going to uh, do a uh, Professor Balram once again. I'm going to make you stand up once more to give a standing ovation to our performers who made us go through that magical, mystical, musical experience that we just had. Please. <laughs> On behalf of everyone at ATRI, I wish to thank Professor Baba, Professor Balram, Ms. Anita Arjundas, Mr. Vamsithar Putula, and all of our board members for their leadership and guidance, Mr. Raj Kushu and family for your friendship and support all over these years, Dr. Kartik Bala Supramaniam, Dr. Vinita Gora, Mr. Praveen Jay, and of course, Mr. Sandesh Kadur for providing such rich insights about the many facets of exploration, discovery, and taxonomy. I, I have to say, Karthik, I'm definitely going to look up Mr. H.V. Gandhi tonight, for sure. Additionally, I wish to thank Arvind, Ganesan, Priyan, and a certain someone that I don't wish to thank who comprised this year's TN Kushu Award Committee, uh, Dr. Siddhartha Shetty for keep, keeping us uh, fed and watered. Thank you. Our IT team, Shiv and Gautam, our library team headed by Obaya, our entire finance team, our accounts team, I, I sorry, I said accounts team and finance team twice. Uh, yeah, thank you so thank you twice actually. Uh, Rashmi, Hema, Ramesh, because without you, no A3 event is ever complete. You're the backbone of any event at A3. And our yes, please. <laughs> and our wonderful, wonderful communications team, Namrata, Tirat, and Jaya, who made this event come to life. Thank you. We had a series of nature walks uh, which led up to this event. And uh, we wish to thank Lab Arvind, Lab T. Ganesh, Lab Ganeshan, and Lab Priyan for the same. But as Vinita has mentioned, names are important, and that is where things begin. So I need to give a shout out to Arjun, Femi, Kirtana, Manoj, Navasmita, Nilanjan, Rajkamal, Ranjit, Ryan, Sahana, Sheshadri, Sneha, Surya, and Tremi. And thank you to all of you for your participation and for your presence, basically. Thank you very much. Hello. After coming down and coming down, after coming down, my little brother, Dere Khan, who came to the Bismillah Khan Award, Nawajit. Today, he came to the phone. He came to the phone and said, you have been to the Khan Award. Namaskar. I'm very happy today. This show is very happy that हम एक लोक कलाकार गांव में रहने वाले जैसलमेर और बाड़मेर से मेरे फादर को पद्मश्री से सम्मानित भारत सरकार ने दिया वो लोक कलाकार में पहली पद्मश्री और लोक कलाकार को कमाई से में पहली पद्मश्री उसके बाद में हम सागर जी ने हमको रास्ता बताया फादर ने हमने उसको किया आज मेरा बड़ी खुशी की बात है इस स्टेट पे मैंने बजा के और मैं नीचे आया मुझे बधा ही आया कि आपका नेशनल अवार्ड हो गया मैं शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ सबका हमारे लिए